um, uh, welcome, um, Andrew. Thank and, you, Brad. Um, I'm going to start this by uh, uh, telling you what an honor it is for me to have you back here yes. to continue our um, conversation, conversation on the topic of education, mm -hmm. particularly given the topic that arises from the two pieces that you have um, chosen for us today. Um, the topic being the spiritual value of education or maybe something like the possibility of the spiritual value in education question mark or mm -hmm. something like that mm -hmm. um, the two pieces that um, uh, I'm so grateful for um, you know your having suggested to, to us are the following. Uh, the first one is an older piece. Perhaps it, it, it reads almost like it comes from a different time and place. Thirties or forties. Uh, it's it's by Simon Vai, and it's titled um, "Straightforwardly Enough on First Appearances: <laughs> uh, Reflections on the Right Use of School Studies with a View to the Love of God." Okay. Was there some irony that's, in that straight forward? That's, 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 well, there is some irony because uh, on the face of it, language can be very dece deceiving. I mean, um, I mean, it's, it, it looks like it's clear what she's going to be telling you. Um, but I think there is a, a lot to be unpacked there. But she's coming. Um, the second piece is from a philosopher that I know is kind of dear to your heart, um, Raymond Gaeta. And it's titled Teaching as a Vocation. Um, when it's called, um, uh, vocation is, 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 is an often used word. It's sort of used interchangeably with profession or occupation. Um, a gator does not mean it in that sense. Uh, he means it, so this is, this is to bring in more to the surface, the spiritual connection, because originally the word, the word vocation meant, in its original use, meant spiritual calling. Yes, calling. Yes. And so it's tied to notions of duty, of responsibility, and other such values that we don't um, normally associate with the idea of a job. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So teaching as a job <coughs> well, is not what we're concerned with here. It's mm. teaching as a vocation. Mm. Now, given that you were the one who have has suggested these <laughs> two readings for us, Andrew, I would be very happy to hear from you why why it is that you have picked these two pieces. <laughs> but maybe and maybe I mean. Um, I mean, let's just let's just be a little bit forthright here to any of the people who may have listened to us in our first conversation. That that first conversation had a kind of strangeness to it. Um, it was a very unusual way to think about what education is. These days, requires, yes. Requires yes. requires some effort. Well, if people thought that that was strange. <laughs> I think that what they're going to get from us now is going to be on a completely different scale. So yes. maybe maybe just ask, yes. answer to me, why why do you want to steer us in this place of extreme weirdness? <laughs> yes, yes, Vlad. Th um, first of all, uh, let me uh, thank you. <laughs> For your hospitality once again at your uh, at your beautiful beachfront home it's a lovely day outside it is and, uh, almost too lovely to you, be here yeah, but, well uh, indeed indeed but uh, hopefully may we go for a beach walk uh, maybe even a swim another day today we're here on serious intellectual business. Mm. Um, the best way I think I can answer your question about uh, strangeness or weirdness um, 
if that's you're not not wanting to use that term in any way that's meant to be disparaging I, I should I should add um, mm -hmm. but it is there is something which is um, I think people when they come to read uh, these papers by Simone Bay and Raymond Gator they will um, find them uh, given the spirit of the times they will find them disconcerting discombobulating maybe confusing uh, strange as you say and perhaps one way just to quickly bring that out for those who, who may have seen our previous video there we were talking about two other philosophers political philosophers who have written uh, uh, on education they were Michael Oakeshott and Leo Strauss and they in many ways shared a similar conception I mean they thought of education as a something of a precious inherent a continuing tradition which bore as it were like um, runners in a uh, in a race passing on the baton to one another the generations passed down a an inheritance of a tradition of thought and inquiry which has uh, accumulated over many centuries and which is passed to new generations through a relationship of apprentice to student um, and Oakeshott refers to this as being a conversation on a set of subjects from uh, philosophy, music and literature to science uh, and to the new social sciences and so forth. Um, to the utilitarian spirit of the age, okay, whether that's utilitarian in the sense of um, making the university the servants of economic policy or turning them into commercial enterprises where they can make heaps of money out of uh, overseas students and so forth and then go bankrupt when there's a pandemic or whether it's in the form of uh, um, those uh, academics who have uh, uh, rankly politicised their subjects and used them for the purpose of uh, indoctrination and uh, political change, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite uh, topical at the present hour. Um, uh, they, their conception of education is what Oakeshott called an intellectual treasure, a, a precious inheritance, a tradition that you have to become literate in. Uh, through initiation into the greatest works in that tradition. Um, that, that already seems um, unusual, it seems very archaic, it seems old-fashioned, obsolete. Um, and then one <laughs> steps from that to read uh, Vale uh, and Gator, and one seems to have gone to another level again, where it uh, it's taken on what um, you know, critics uh, might seem to, to find a rather peculiar mystical or religious or spiritual uh, air, which is not there in any overt way for sure, I think, in, in Oakeshott or, or um, uh, Strauss. So we've gone to a new level with this new material, so we'll see how we go with it in our attempt to, to understand it and, and maybe hopefully to throw, throw some sort of life on it. So. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm going to do my best uh, to yeah. do that, and I'm sure you will too, but you still, I think you still haven't quite um, answered my question. Oh, okay, sorry. I mean, I think, mm. I think you, you, you uh, are right to talk about the spirit of the times in the, in the way you do, um, and um, what's wrong with it, Andrew? I mean, I, I mean I, uh, why can't you keep up with your times? Are you some kind <laughs> of dinosaur? I mean, uh, why are you? Do you like beating on dead horses, or uh, what is what is the spirit that animates you? I, 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 are you bearing some kind of nostalgia for things lost, or uh, just? I'm I'm, 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 I'm trying to get to the bottom of my question. Why did you think it was, in, in some sense, uh, worthwhile? To choose just, 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 just. Mm. I mean, I mean, it's not simply to make the point that things change. We all know that they do. Um, uh, and I, I, I take it that at the very least, I'm just going to suggest this to you, and then you maybe, maybe can tell me what, um, some kind of insight may be gained from an appreciation of what has been lost, if it has been lost. Mm -hmm. I would say that that would be kind of like a bare minimum, if it is, if it is, 
to be worthwhile to look into outdated, outmoded, if not barely, barely alive and kicking uh, ways of being, ways of understanding. Uh, what, what would be the what would be the value? Um, hmm. And 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 also just tell me what I mean. Why why you picked on these two guys? Why I picked them in particular? Yeah, that, well, that's I mean the, the answer to that is uh, merely uh, I think of, of little interest. Uh, it, they're just the ones that I I happen to read. Um, I happen to know about. Uh -huh. um, I, and, and then I found to be of value. Now, I could take that thought in a certain direction, but I might first try and just answer your more general. Uh, are so, you, many are you a dinosaur? so many roads you could always go in any direction with, with these, these things. But mm. what, to, try and, to, to try and answer your, 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 your question to me about the past and, and uh, what is the, the value of, of looking at ideas that appear uh, obsolete or... Uh, um, strangely uh, archaic or something like that. Um, I mean, I think that maybe a, that language that I used overstates the case uh, somewhat. The first thing to notice is that they're not obsolete and archaic to everyone. Okay, sure. And the people to whom you know, such as Gator, um, to whom who obviously believes that um, you know the work of, of a philosopher like Simone Weil. Um, is of great importance, and he's certainly influenced her thinker. I don't think he refers to her in this piece, but I know he's influenced by her. Um, you know, knowing his work as I do, his work as a whole, um, and knowing him slightly, not, not, not well, but slightly to some degree, um, I know that uh, this, this interest is uh, no mere... Uh, Nostalgia. It's no mere antiquarianism. It's um, you know his interest in Plato, for example, which comes across very uh, strongly in his uh, essay mm. on teaching as a vocation, is uh, born of a um, uh, a deep reading of Plato, and and um, you know uh, one is simply um, finds. The meat where you find it, and I have found meat in his work, and I have found mm. meat in her work, Bay's work, in the same way as I found meat of a different sort uh, in in Oakshot and um, and Strauss. So I, I don't know how else to, you know, you have to, you have to eat the dish to to, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the the proof of the pudding is in the eating. To use the old metaphor, I suppose. Um, that's and 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 only in that way can one. You know, and, and I mean, Gator talks, he touches on, on this point uh, toward the end of his paper, he says, yes. where, where he, he says, look, you know, he, he uses, uh, he makes a um, comparison with architecture and he says, you know, uh, the architect, the modern architect who draws on the past, okay, if he, I mean, it would be not, he would, he would I think, want to say it would not be a good idea for an architect to simply ignore the past, to think that we are so superior that we can simply, completely, uh, we think we've transcended everything that's gone before and we simply begin ab initio, okay, and out of our own heads we can create great buildings and great architects without any other attention to the past. On the other hand, we're not merely slavish imitators either. We're not merely mechanical reproducers of what's gone before. And what he says is, I think close to a quotation here, he says that, We've got to appropriate older traditions in architecture in a way that can give them a, a serious place in our own modern circumstances. Finding our own architectural language the same way as we need to find a language in the ordinary sense to express ideas which were living in Plato or living in Aristotle or living in Descartes or, or living in Homer or, or whatever, whoever it might be who's in the educational tradition and similarly for his kind of ideas about education. So that's, I mean, in broad terms, I mean, it's, I mean, in a sense, I'm just sort of deferring the answer to say, well, we've got to, we've got to read the papers and we've, and, and to see that this is, that this is no mere, this is no mere, uh, um, reproduction of the past. It's not a rejection of the present. It's not a running away from the present era and its problems and so forth.
Well, he he ends on a. Um, uh, I mean, I've, I've underlined here a couple of um, uh, uh, so. He ends by noting that the problem with the kind of spiritual value, or he calls it intrinsic value, of education is, uh, is, is not just to sort out the various senses of the value, but to see how much of what is deep is accessible to us, to us beyond its mere acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. Our task is to see how many of the intimations of depth in our rhetoric of the intrinsic value of the scholarly and intellectual life are honestly and lucidly accessible to us in living and authoritative speech. Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to dwell too much on that. What is living today? When you go to the sections on spirituality, in a bookshop, Andrew. Yes. Okay. Um, you will find um, books on tarot readings, lots and lots of New Age, mm -hmm. a lot of Eastern mm -hmm. gurus. What we call spiritual life today, or something like. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we not so, so much might, might pass for a certain kind of spirituality. I mean, the question is whether these, these, this is real spirituality. What I'm talking about here. I mean, the fact that there are these things which are very popular and very much alive in the in in our culture at large. And I'm not. I mean, it's important to keep in mind that Gaeta is talking here about intellectual culture and a difficulty that is within intellectual culture itself. I mean, the fact that libraries have sections titled, titled spirituality with such books in them yes. should already be an indicator of a deep and profound corruption from a certain point of view, I would argue. Um, what, what passes for spirituality today? Well, you have the cult of the body, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know the, 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 those those perfect perfect teeth uh, with the with the aid of of, of um, you know uh, a modern medicine um, you know my, my crooked teeth could have been made to look <laughs> absolutely perfect yeah. this incredible whiteness on display mm -hmm. people spend hours upon hours upon hours of their time mm -hmm. in gyms to get the sculpted body that uh, that they want. So it's a cult of the body. So there's also the the cult of the perfect health. You know, people people devote a certain make a, 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 a certain amount of, of, of effort into ensuring that they live a perfectly healthy life. There's a fixation on on good nutrition, on uh, working out, on eliminating certain things. So. I'm just simply um, uh, highlighting the things that I think are alive in the culture right now. Mm -hmm. You say that uh, Christianity, in um, uh, in the sense that we might find it reflected in in um, in um, Vai's essay, is still alive today. Mm -hmm. If it is, it's, it's, it's something that is marginal, out of view, it, it doesn't have any echo. Mm, mm. Um, so, 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 yeah, I mean, you might, so, yeah. so what, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just uh, 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 putting, putting this to you as, uh, as my impression of, uh, uh, but also I think I'm, I'm getting some support from the sense uh, uh, this is this is a warning that uh, Gator gives at the end. The nature, uh, I'm just, I said I wasn't going to do it, but I will. The nature and reality of moral and spiritual uh, and spiritual value is considerably more difficult to understand than has been appreciated by most, usually conservative, 
cultural commentators who have been obsessed with the superficial relativism which marks much of our cultural life. Mm, 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 mm. So, okay. so, 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 so it's not simply to point out the superficial relativism, it's also to get an appreciation that the, the, the spiritual traditions that are the lifeblood of the values that the two want to bring into view mm. are disappearing. Mm. And if they exist, it's like at the beginning when the, uh, you know, uh, in the catacombs, mm. Mm. okay? They're in the catacombs, okay? Uh, I mean, obviously it's a metaphor, but I, I do not see them in public life anywhere. No, you, look, sorry, you, you're of course quite right that, um, um, they're not any longer any part of the, the Indian house of the culture. Uh, that's certainly true. Um, what I meant in saying that there are people who, um, for whom these are living forces, um, is that there are, there are people who do take uh, the sort of, these sorts of things seriously and who... I do. Uh, yes, and, and, and you're a good example, but I was, I was going to use gay people. But I'm weird. Well, well no. <laughs> put aside whether you're weird or not. Okay? <laughs> My point just is that whether you're weird or not, you are not merely someone who's engaging in nostalgia. You're not merely somebody who's merely getting, 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 going, get, has some antiquarian, you know, some peculiar kind of stamp collecting to do with the past or something. No, you... You want these things as a living force in your life and you would like to see them as a living force in the culture. And that doesn't come from some blind hatred of everything that's modern in the culture. And you're not just some sort of cranky reactionary who... who as, you know, and I think sometimes you do see that kind of phenomenon. Mm. Um, um, mm. You see people who, you know, they will say, well, I'll embrace... Well, what, what's the... Um, you know, how, how can I... Uh, uh, what, what can I do to uh, hold up, uh, you know, two fingers to the modern culture? Oh, yes, well, you know, what, what, what would piss off the, uh, okay, the modern... Uh, uh, the leftists. The, 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 well, leftists and, and just sort of um, dominant uh, secular and modern attitudes more generally. Well, you know, I'll become a uh, very conservative Roman Catholic or something like that. I think you do get that kind of people who seem to embrace yeah. religion or something for really that, sorry to kind, that kind yeah. of reason. Um, anyway, can I just can I just pick up on um, about the uh, spirituality and your your example of you going to a bookshop and you see a, a, a whole shelf labeled spirituality, and uh, you know there might be a Bible uh, here or two there, but apart from that, what the what you see? I mean, I have read a little bit of literature, this sort of literature in my time of life. I mean, typical examples would be someone like like. Deepak Chopra, in fairness to him, I've never read him, but I, I, he's the kind of person you commonly see. And these books are full of advice on, you know, how to make your life really better, how to make your career go well, how to make your marriage go well, how to make your relationship. These are often best-selling books, you know, and they're, and I'm not saying there's no value in any of the things they're saying in them. They're, they're, I think, you know, stuff that I remember reading many, many years ago, there were some helpful tips in it and that, but... I want to make a draw a con, and I wish I'd brought with me a good example of, of that kind of literature and its kind of tone. It's 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 a kind of upbeat. Um, you can take on the world. You can uh, you can achieve anything with a kind of positive attitude. Um, you know, I mean, I'm generalising about the about the literature, but it's got that kind of tone, and it's got no no little to no sense of history. Or historical resonance to it, and no sense of importance here beyond your a kind of self fulfillment ethic, your life going well in some kind of way. Let me, by contrast, read to you. And this is not long; it's quite short. No, a no, no. A, um, a piece of writing that goes I've back to, uh, centuries, which was once very central to the culture because it was read at the grave of just about everybody who died. Mm -hmm. and it gives a very different way of talking about human life, life and the significance of human life than you would find in the modern literature of a book that was in the, um, the, uh, the spirituality section at, at uh, Dylan's or wherever. Um, 
It comes from the 5059 Book of Common Prayer, the burial order. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Even as it hath pleased the Lord, so cometh things to pass. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Man that is born of a woman hath but a short time to live, and is full of misery. He cometh up, and is cut down like a flower. He flieth, as it were, a shadow, and never continueth in one stay. In the midst of life we be in death, of whom may we seek for succour, but of thee, O Lord. Thou knowest, Lord, the secrets of our hearts. Shut not up thy merciful eyes to our prayers, but spare us, Lord, most holy. For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of our dear brother, he had departed. We therefore commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in sure and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. I just add one thing to it. Even if one can, you know, I've known people who kind of have used this language and, and just taken out all the references to God and to Christ, okay? Put aside for the moment whether that's a good thing to do. There's still enough left, even for a person who's sort of not a Christian, to see that here there's a way of speaking about uh, human life which mm -hmm. is human gentle condition. and beautiful and perceptive in a way which I think you struggle to find in these books, uh, these popular self-help uh, manuals. Um, for a start, there's a, there's, there's a, kind, a kind of perspective upon the world, sub specie eternitatis, from the point of view of eternity, from not from something that where you're seeing, and in a way that its age and the archaic nature of the language um, uh, reinforces that, that, that this is not something that's tied to the limited perspective of one time and place. On the other hand, I don't want to suggest by this that you know, we, we, in the modern world, that we should necessarily be speaking like this, or that we should even necessarily reinstitute this as a standard burial ceremony, but... Gator is also saying we have to find ways of speaking which can make some of the ideas and thoughts that are in here live again in ways that are meaningful for us in our, in our circumstances. I'm... I've just... I've noticed yes. this impulse in myself, which is that... I approach every task of reading, or new, of real learning, that what defines my sense that what it is that I'm about to do is some real learning, mm -hmm. which is what I bring to the task of reading these two articles, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is a certain longing for home. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's as if I'm assuming that what real learning, real education should do is take me home. <sighs> I mean, even as if our friend were here, uh, he would say, Oh, flat. What are you talking about? You are home. This is your home. <laughs> sure. Um, um, actually, um, our Western cultural tradition has what I'm increasingly realizing is that what conditions this sense in me of what it is to learn, a, a return home, is something that runs very deep in our mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. One of the first great epic poems by Homer, mm -hmm. uh, you've read it, <laughs> The Odyssey, mm -hmm. has our hero, Ulysses, following him on a journey. One particularly 
his returning to his place of birth, Ithaca, to his wife, Penelope, um, and his son, who are, who've been waiting for him for a very long time. And he and his companion, the, the, the poem follows him on his journey back home. What I want to bring out that stands out in that poem is the meaning of home, that mm -hmm. home had mm -hmm. for him. Mm -hmm. At one point, he and his companions end up on the island of Aeia, I think, where an immortal goddess and a witch, a sorceress, lives. And she turns all of his men into pigs and he manages to escape it by drinking. He's his very ingenious man, Odysseus. And he convinces Circe to return his companions to normality. And Odysseus lives with this gorgeous, beautiful goddess who offers him every comfort imaginable and immortality only to stay there with her. Mm -hmm. And at one point in the poem we find Odysseus on the shores of Aia, just shedding tears mm -hmm. in longing mm -hmm. for home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. what does home mean to him? Something that he is willing to give all the comforts and even immortality. Mm -hmm. Something that he can die for. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, later we have uh, perhaps the most famous story uh, in the Bible, in the Gospels, is the story of the prodigal son. I think that's the probably, it's fair to say that it is the... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That too describes a journey of estrangement coming home and return mm, mm, mm. Mm, mm, mm. Um, of course for Christians home is where the heart is so when you look at early Christian documents such as the letter from Diognetus mm. what you'll find about the Christian sensibility is that they carry their home with them wherever they are and we can come back to this as we're exploring the, 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 the kind of spirituality that, that they, they have, they're at home wherever they are because God is in their hearts. And, and I was just, I was also thinking, just as you said, that the, the whole uh, um, Christian, the whole biblical story is a story of returning home, okay, of falling away from home, losing home, and then recovering it through so God, it's not one, work, but, yeah. but it's kind of strange that I should I associate the idea of education that what my thirst mm. is for. I mean, I, I'm just talking here about my instincts. I just want to move on a little bit because here I'm talking about very ancient traditions and I want to signal that a disturbance. Mm -hmm. So what can home mean for the modern? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to probably get a little bit polemical here, but I think what I'm about to say will strike some people at least as a fairly fair <laughs> idea of what the modern... I'm going to say a little bit about the postmodern idea of home what the postmodern sense of home might be. In the relevant sense we're talking about here. Mm. Um, um, so, so 
let me just pause a little bit to, to mark the things. Home is what grounds you, what matters to you, mm -hmm. what defines you and gives you sense. Mm -hmm. Right? I hope that's hopefully clear enough. Mm -hmm. The thing that you think is worth living for and dying for. Um, that's home. Um, well, the classical, the classical idea of, of home, which, which is, which is in the, in, in our, in our cultural tradition. What can, um, the modern idea of home? Well, I think, just going to be a bit sketchy here, the modern idea of home is now. Home is now the latest. The latest, the, the most up-to-date point of view on the world is, as might be revealed by some theory. Um, that's what home is. Um, I'm, I'm just going to kind of home, home here. I, I'm, I'm using this idea of home. Where it's at, it's where you are, because you, you think of yourself as the latest and hence the peak and far superior to anything that has gone on before you. The modern man or woman has this sense of themselves as owing next to nothing to the past. Where do you find it? Well, let's just, you've mentioned the two political philosophers. In philosophy, you will find it, I believe, in John Rawls, in his theory of justice, which is, I think it's not an exaggeration to say, which is the most significant in the Anglo sphere, Anglo-American philosophy, the most significant work in political philosophy of the second half of the 20th century. And uh, Alan Bloom noticed in, 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 a, in a kind of a, a review of the book, he notes the following about Rawls. He doesn't engage with his own tradition the contractualist tradition, Hobbes, mm -hmm. Rousseau, people, Kant, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he doesn't, he does, they don't even get a mention, mm -hmm. um, let alone mm -hmm. traditions of thought about justice outside of those traditions. Mm -hmm. There is a little bit of an engagement with utilitarianism, but nothing else besides. There is a sense of a supreme kind of arrogance um, which is fairly typical. I, I, I hope I'm not being too unfair there. That, that sort of characterizes because he's writing to his, to his peers. Mm -hmm. So his peers find that perfectly acceptable. There is, I should say, something more than ironic in the fact that the particular device that he uses, the, his famous veil of ignorance, okay, is not, I mean, for somebody who, with a little bit more humility and, and dedication, may have paid some sort of an attention to um, to the history of, of thought and of philosophy. And by the way, I mean, there are philosophers who are perfectly aware of the problem that I'm actually uh, bringing up here, which, uh, I mean, you, you, you find, for example, Wilfred, uh, 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 Wilfred Sellers in, in, in uh, uh, Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind saying something like, philosophy without the history of philosophy is, is, is if not dumb, then blind. Um, the particular uh, uh, device at the heart of his theory, which is the, the, the procedure 
which he calls the veil of ignorance. Actually, it's not his invention. It, it, it came about, so it's, 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 it's essentially um, the old idea of, of secularism, which came about, so the idea of the secular, if we read somebody like, like um, uh, Tom Holland in his book Dominion, so the history of the Western mind, and, and, <laughs> right, we find the, the, the origins of the, of, of the idea at the end of the 30-year war, the terrible 30-year war between the, um, the Protestants and the Catholics, um, um, which was settled with this invention which was actually brilliant, which was, it was never meant to displace religion from the life of the city. It was simply an agreement to let things be resolved by a procedure. Mm -hmm. The procedure requiring you to enter it that let's pretend we don't know what God wants us to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's, let's, let's just try to sort this out under the assumption, find a way of sorting this out under the assumption that we don't know what God wants us it's to do. essentially without God. Right? Yeah. Here's the secular. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the invention of the secular sphere coming okay. from... And, and so, so I, I just, I'm just going to uh, just, just, yeah. just move on a little bit more. Just a couple more things. Yeah. So, and of course, his own uh, role's own uh, uh, preferred... Uh, well, what he thinks he gets out of that veil of ignorance, his own principle, the one that he thinks would <laughs> be ag agreed on from the veil of ignorance, is but a very thinly veiled version of the Christian I idea that the last will be first. Okay? The difference principle. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay. So, so... Um, we, we, we should say to, to uh, you know, um, viewers who may not be philosophers or familiar with this is, <laughs> is that Rawls, Rawls is one of the principles which Rawls believes that a just society would be governed by says that uh, any differences in any inequalities in wealth that exist uh, or they should be permitted, inequalities in wealth should be permitted only to the extent that this lifts up uh, 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 um, people from the, at the bottom of society to an extent that they would not be lifted up if you didn't have those inequalities. So that's, that's just to explain that. That's so right. So, so that's right. So I mean, any inequality so is like permitted. Your, any I like the Christian connection you've made with it. Yes, yeah, yes. well, I'm sure that it is. I mean, he, uh, he uh, 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 so, so, so. I don't so, know that it's necessarily a good representation of the Christian, but I can see the analogy that, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. well, I mean, I would want to ask the following uh, counterfactual. Mm. And it's by no means mm. obvious mm. that, yeah. I mean, to me, it seems plausible to say mm. this, this, this counterfactual yeah. is had Rawls not been the inheritor, unacknowledged and un ungrateful. <laughs> inheritor of the cultural tradition of Christianity, would he have? I think he put was. I think, I think he was quite Christian in his youth, I believe. I, I, so I, would I, he I, have these? Yeah. Would he? Would he? Would he say those things? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, and then yeah. so so yeah. yeah. Can I connect this to to? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, want to say one more thing, but you do that first. Well, no, no, you you you. I, I'll be a while as well. So you. I want to. I want to talk about what postmodernism. So I, I gave I gave a certain yeah. sketch of what the modern idea of home is. Yeah. Home is where you are. Yeah. Because you're the top. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. find home when you've yeah. when you've um mm. come by some well. Whatever learning th things uh, to 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 occupy this position um, of knowledge that where you feel somehow superior to everyone in your past and 
cleverer, better, just just better mm -hmm. by, by being in that position. That's I'm putting that forward as a mm -hmm. as, as 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 an idea of that's home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's po what's what could be a postmodern okay. uh, version? I want to say something yeah. because because increasingly we live in a in a world where postmodernism is is unfortunately making its mark through its infiltration of our culture mm. and the political life our education um so in relation to home yeah well i think yeah. that what it is it's home is never here always in the future mm -hmm. always always yeah. just when you thought you had it sorted out just when you thought you sorted out uh yeah. um well there are two genders and then there are gay people and well no that's a mistake mm -hmm. um i mean the so you see that in the proliferation just when you think that society has reached some kind of point where we can sort of settle and 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 no no the goalposts kind of move mm. further along i mean mm, mm, um mm, mm. Uh, douglas murray talks about the sense of mm. things being in constant flux i mean there is home for many people um a sense of i mean using home as something of a metaphor here um one has a sense of um, you know, people not all that long ago, you know, say my parents' generation or even my own generation, which, you know, which is the, the baby boomers, um, one grew up with a sense of uh, Australia was one home, one felt some sort of loyalty to Australia, one felt some sort of, uh, one, one, one may feel in mixed ways, certainly, about its, its history and its, um, um, but, but one felt some kind of, attachment to it, some kind of pride in it, one identified to it to a certain extent. One could feel ashamed of things in its history as well, but, mm. but one nevertheless, one sense of home, one's political sense of home, one's national sense of home was related to the past of a particular political yep. society and a particular, a, a particular people and so on. At the extreme opposite of that, okay, is everyone for all sense of home is invested in the future. It's the okay. it's the paradise that they they would bring about yeah. if the, only they had all the power. And the future, because the future isn't here yet, okay, there's a sense in which the, the you know their home is is you know, they don't have a home because it's yet to come. Correct. Um, now correct. And 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 Rawls is a good example in a way, although Rawls is by no means a kind of any kind of extremist, but but. But he, um, um, you know, all those people in what behind what Rawls calls the veil of ignorance, where a group of people who don't know their race, they don't know their sex, they don't know their gender, they don't know their class position or whatever, but they sit down to negotiate the rules that they will have for their political association under the conditions of this ignorance, in the hope that being ignorant, okay, they will agree to rules that will be fair. They won't try and gerrymander the rules so that it advantages me for being white or for being male or for whatever it might be. Um, what we have is a group of people who don't have a home, okay? They are homeless in the most radical sense. So, so that's really good. But in, in relation to, uh, to pull it back to, to Gator, uh, he begins with um, Plato. And he begins with Socrates and Callicles, and Gator is putting on the table the question of: Is it a worthy life? Can can, can a, a mature adult worthily devote? Can a mature human being worthily devote their adult life to the pursuit of philosophy, as Socrates, of course, has done? And Callicles somewhat cynically, okay, 
poo-poos, the whole idea, it's fine when you're young, okay? A bit like sowing your wild oats when you're young, but you're expected to settle down. Similarly, you can play around with ideas and all that kind of thing when you're young, but, you know, grow up. It has, know, a, it has a use. It ha I don't think he thinks it's valueless. No, 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 but it, you don't do it when you're... 50 years old, a Socrates, serious, okay? you a grow serious up. You assume responsibilities. man with a sense of his own ability, of his own dignity, uh, wouldn't choose it that's right. as, as a life, way of life. That's right. As a and, way of life. And, and, and Gator's essay here on education is a way, in a way, a protracted meditation on this exchange between Callicles and Socrates and a kind of defence of Socrates and the idea that philosophy and other disciplines that have come down to us in our intellectual and our university tradition are things to which a person can worthily give give a life. So he wants to say that there is this there is this kind of moral or spiritual. I don't know that he either uses either of those words, but he he talks of spiritual. You know that that, that education is one of his central themes. Is that education is not just the transmission of knowledge um, it's let alone information it's not merely scholarship it's not merely uh, learning uh, much less is it skills it's not merely the acquisition of a technique for acquiring knowledge or anything like that um, and the teacher is not merely an instrument for achieving those things an instrument that could be replaced by I don't know um, you know, a computer a, program, computer program, some sort. So, so just to finish up, just to, mm. um, uh, he wants to explore what it is to be able to think of our university subjects like philosophy, which he's a philosopher, so that's the subject he's most concerned with, uh, in a way that sees them as the pursuit. A, a pursuit that it could be worthy for someone to devote their entire lives to or even to give their life to. And he thinks that that's the kind of importance which an intellectual discipline can have. And that's a really radical idea, you know. Kind of, you know, Socrates, you know. But yet that idea is there right at the very early, the greatest philosopher in the history of that discipline. Yeah. A man who lived homeless, well, he wasn't quite homeless, but pretty close to it on the street, uh, grabbing food wherever he could, or wandering around the marketplace in the streets, talking philosophy with anyone who would um, talk with him about it, not interested in uh, an academic position, not interested in academic preferment, not interested in jobs, didn't publish any papers, didn't have any academic awards or honours. And, and didn't he, think he would. He didn't think he would deserve any for what he did. And didn't think he would deserve any. And who, in the end, because he pursued truth as relentlessly as he did, was killed for it by uh, the, 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 the state of Athens. So, mm. so, so that's what Gato is on about here. And so, your idea of home and of education as a kind of coming home. To um, your roots, to what, to to the to 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 what grounds you, to what gives sense and meaning and to you your can, life, the things that you would die for rather than losing. Okay, so are we willing to die for philosophy like Socrates? I mean, is that something? Well, I mean, it sounds you you to to the modern ear that may sound melodramatic, but is it something we can take seriously? Today. Well, that is the question. So I think that um, it's it's that kind of depth that um, um, Gaeta tries to speak to, find a way. And the question which I put to you in one of our previous conversations on this was with a, the subjects that he is talking about, which for him would be proper, deserving objects of the kind of love that a teacher 
is to um, is to reveal in the act of teaching um, the kind of love for a thing that you center your life around or you give your life to, you dedicate your life to. That so, so the object of that love being the subject here. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. So we want a subject such that it is worthy of being the object of that kind of love. That's right. And not... Um, now, the question that I put to you yes. was, well, is the subject capable of bearing this kind of burden? Are subjects... Um, one, so that seems to me to be one really important uh, question to ask. Um, Can I say something? Just, just sure. In, in, I mean, um, it's hard for us to fully appreciate it living in the relatively comfortable conditions uh, that we do in a country like Australia. But I mean, think of being a philosopher in uh, you're from Romania. Uh, think of philosophers in the Eastern Bloc during the Cold War. Um, um, of course, many of them, just like many under the Nazis, Heidegger notoriously, with great alacrity and ingenuity, uh, promptly accommodated themselves to the spirit of the and requirements of the regime. But there were some who did not, okay, and mm -hmm. there was and who who paid the price for uh, you know uh, for their unwillingness to do so, for their unwillingness to prostitute their subject. Mm. Unfortunately, and, there were very few in Romania uh, like well, that. Well, well, indeed, there are very few. But I'm giving that trying to think here in, in modern circumstances, mm -hmm. you know, and <laughs> the way it's gone, Vlad, <laughs> um, who knows whether it could be our circumstances, you know, what I'm getting at is that here I'm trying to think of a practical way in which a philosopher in the 20th century could be in, you know, uh, circumstances similar to, to, to Socrates where um, not just that you know he's a democrat and a, and a, someone who doesn't believe in totality you don't have to be a philosopher to do that but who refuses to let his discipline be undermined by forces that are inherently antithetical to it and wish only to at the risk it. at yeah. the risk up of to his life yeah. or her life yeah. i uh, can i just yeah. put an, a, a different angle on that. Yeah. I think it was also Jesus who said that the truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, being home equates to achieving a kind of freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Establishing a kind of freedom for yourself. Um, a kind of freedom that survives in the depths of the gulag. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm saying mm -hmm. you could be free in that mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. even if incarcerated yeah. and yeah. tortured. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm drawing, I'm not sure how to unpack this but I think that for me at least in, in my longing for home Okay. My longing for, in the in the relevant sense, mm -hmm. is it's it's essentially tied to achieving a kind of freedom, freedom from from the things that don't matter, freedom from the things that are 
badly. Mm-hmm. Now, connecting that to, to the idea of a coming home yes. in education, I mean, in Plato, as we were discussing the other night, the, the, the obvious thing that comes to mind there is the, is the Mino and, and the, yep. the, the doctrine of recollection. So, so it's, um, it's um, and I, I think I remarked when we discussed it then, that uh, um, if one thinks of, of learning, especially learning over a lifetime, there's an enormous amount that one comes back to again and again and again. We've often remarked here, when you read the sort of, say, a standard analytic philosophy article, um, the only re- once you've, you know, kind of, uh, there's only kind of contingent reasons of limited memory and limited cognitive, limited brain power why you need to read it more than once, okay? It's not like you could come back, you know, once you've grasped it, that's it, it's done. You know, you, Get you, counterexample to the tripartite analysis of knowledge. Well, whatever. Well, that type kind you of could thing. amuse yourself with come for a while coming up with different variations on it. But with Plato, okay, <laughs> you come back again and again and again, okay, not just because your memory is poor, not just because you're, you know, not that, you're, you're a bit thick or whatever it might be, you come because there's a depth there that, that it, you, you, you're not going to exhaust. And um, so... And so that in, in coming back to ideas, not only do you come back to the same ideas and look at them again and again and find more in them or another dimension to them, each time you do that, you are coming back to something that you found valuable and something which you sensed was there. You smelt it at some time. You read, okay, mm-hmm. a little bit of Plato, a little bit of some philosopher that you admire, a little bit of Wittgenstein, someone like that, and you didn't really understand it. But you had you had a sense and in a way a kind of trust or a faith. And this is getting into, into things Bay talks about now. Yeah. That there is something here which mm. is really important. And as over a lifetime of thinking about it, your mind returns to the same books and the same things again and again and again. For nourishment. Way, for nourishment that nourishes you in the freedom that you talked about, but yeah. which is a kind of coming home where you re- repeatedly re- it's like a an animal that returns to the same source of the nourishment again and again and again, because what you find in it is something which you feel that deep in your heart, I'm inclined to say, you hanker after all, all your life. So that you're, 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 you come into this world, and again it comes back to the Christian theme of a home that's lost and regained. You come into this world, we come into it feeling somewhat estranged or alienated, Sure. And we're looking. Gavolfenheit. We're looking for. Heidegger. <laughs> we're looking for <laughs> the home that we feel that we've lost. That's a recurrent theme. Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe that's what Odysseus is doing as well. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's there in the intellectual discipline as well when it has this dimension maybe it to it. Took, so, yeah. say to get him to realize, mm. to appreciate where. Home, what home was for him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Often it takes some trial and tribulation, mm-hmm. some strife, some mm-hmm. suffering. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Being too comfortable might not be a good recipe for finding your home. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, just uh, on the question about my, my life and my routine, yeah, yeah. I think that what I'm after is not, is to be able to see my my daily routine in the light of what grounds me. Mm-hmm. If I can't see that, mm-hmm. if I can't connect the two, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not free. Are they connectable? Well, that is a that is a question for me to answer, mm-hmm. and it's not a question that I can answer to you. Mm-hmm. It's because, but it is a question that mm-hmm. that. Uh, is there for yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, mm, 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 mm. Um, yeah. Um. Because yeah, it is. Am I, am I true? Yeah, yeah. To my ground in the way I live. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I don't know. Mm, 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 mm. I mean, I'm. You know, it's. It's 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 some, but it's something that. Uh, ought to. Um, 
preoccupy me. I ought to invest some time and thought in it. Yeah. I I think I am. Yeah. Yeah. I can, but there's always the suspicion that you're you're giving rationalization. Right. So so it's 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 it's, it's, it's not easy to settle in a no. comfortable place in relation to that question. I don't find it easy. No, no, no. no. Okay. Um, um, yeah. mm, mm. Okay, well, I was just, I was just going, I mean, we, we should probably get to, to say something about Leia, but... Um, um, 